like this statement. It says this, fear of difference is a fear of life itself. It is possible to conceive of conflict as not necessarily a wasteful outbreak of incompatibilities, but a normal process by which socially vulnerable differences register themselves for the enrichment of all. I like the idea that we don't have to be so religiously fixed that we can't have discussion outside of what we have been accustomed to. Do do you understand that? And the discussions that we've been having, this is the third one, it's not that I'm in any way attempting to make you change your thought. You can hold to any of the thoughts that you want, but we don't have to be enemies for it, you know? Like if you want to believe, as I thought, that Satan's real name is Lucifer, that's fine by me. You can call him Lucifer all you like. It doesn't worry. You can, you can call him Harry if you want to. I, it doesn't worry me. All right. You can use those terms. But what I want to do, especially as I get older, is to be open to be able to look at the word and, and not critique the word, but critique my beliefs to see how they line up. Like forever I thought of the scripture of Hebrews uh, 4 to coming this way, where it's this way, and understanding how much Greek thought comes in rather than the Hebrew faith that came through. I, I want to bring this up to you. When I think of, and I'm doing this introduction, and remember when I do these things, I'm not putting it down, but it's keeping to the scriptures and understanding that it's always difficult with the English Bible it's not a fault of the translations. I'm not blaming the fault of the translations because when you read the translations, it's not that they're inaccurate. So the only Bible translation that calls Satan Lucifer in Isaiah is the King James, old King James. But sorry, it doesn't call Satan Lucifer, but the only place where the word Lucifer is mentioned is in the old King James. And it has been well-meaning Christians who have taken that to mean it was Satan's name. But it's not talking about the fall of Satan. It was a prophetic word of Nebuchadnezzar and how far he would fall because he saw himself as the morning star. But the problem has been to where people have taken that to mean it was the devil and that the devil is the morning star. Therefore, when you say, Lord, you're the king of kings, Lord of lords, the bright and morning star, people say, why are you glorifying Satan? And I'd say, I'm not. Revelation 22, last chapter, Jesus himself says, I'm the bright and morning star. You can look it up yourself, Revelation 22. But the word Lucifer comes from the Latin translation. And in the Latin, the word Lucifer means bright and morning star. It doesn't mean the devil. Now, there's some Christians, it doesn't matter what I tell them, they're still going to believe the earth's flat and they're still going to believe these things are going to happen. So it don't make no difference. Just God bless you, don't worry about it. It's not worth having the conversation. It's just not worth it. That mindset, okay? And that's fine. You know, love God and do the best for Jesus. That's okay. It's, 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 it's not a point to break fellowship, amen? It's okay. Hold, do whatever you want, just love Jesus. That's all that matters to me. But you know, the King James Bible was not the first English translation. You know, in 1380, around about that time, you had Wycliffe who, who brought the English translation from the Latin Vulgate, which was how the Catholics had put it through, the Latin Vulgate. And it was Wycliffe in 1380 who brought out the English translation. And then with his death, he died natural causes. The Pope declared that he was uh, uh, not of God, that he was, what's the word? The, a, heretic. a heretic. And so they ordered all of his translations in English. And then you had King Richard III in England who agreed, who was Catholic. And they ordered all of their translations, the Wycliffe burnt, destroyed. And they ordered that Wycliffe's body be dug up and burnt in the ashes, scattered. Then we go on then into the 1500s, around about 1530, you have Tyndale. Now, Tyndale was the first English translation that was actually written from the Hebrew and Greek direct. And Tyndale had that area. Now, Henry VIII was the king of England at that time, and uh, he was having his own battles, had to do with promiscuity and multiple marriages and etc. But the fact of the matter is, is that Tyndale translated the Bible into English from the Greek and Hebrew Hebrew of the old and Aramaic and Greek from the new. And he translated it through into English. 
But because the church had already ordered that any rewriting of the Bible from Wycliffe was a heretic, they tricked him into going to Brussels. They tied him to a stake and they strangled him and then burnt his body. And uh, all that. But the last words that Tyndale said in, in um, Brussels before he died, he yelled out and says, may the King of England's eyes be opened. Wow. Hmm. And it was two years later that King Richard I'm sorry, that King Henry VIII separated from the Roman Catholic Church, established what they'd call the Church of England or the Anglican Church, and that he embraced Tyndale's English writing of the Bible. Okay, that's how it came about. When Henry VIII died, okay, his son in 1547, Edward VI, took the throne. And Edward, okay, is the first one that has been raised or brought uh, into the, the Puritan movement or the Protestant movement. And there's a group of people that came up through Henry in England. I'm talking about the English Puritans, okay, not the Dutch Puritans. There's a group of Protestants that came up from Henry that said, we want to purify the Church of England from its Catholic practices. Because even though they pulled out of the Roman Catholic Church, it's still, even today, it still continues certain Roman Catholic practices. And so this group of Protestants who rose up, English Puritans we call them, who rose up under Henry and then more so through Edward saying, let's really separate and hold to the Scriptures rather than the religious area. Now he didn't live too long because in 1533, his half-sister, and remember Henry had eight wives and that's the main reason why he left the Catholic Church, not because of a godly reformation, because he wanted to be the head of the church so he could divorce and remarry and the Pope said you can't divorce and remarry so that's really where it's at. And in the year of, of 1553, Mary, his half-sister, became the queen. Now Mary is a Catholic and they called her Bloody Mary. And it's not a drink. They call the Bloody Mary because the streets ran with the blood of Protestants, Puritans. And she went out to say, all the properties that my father took off the Catholic Church to make Protestant and all of those who never, we're going to take the properties back to the name of the Catholics and we're going to kill and get rid of all of the Protestants. That's what happened there. She didn't live very long. And then her half-sister, Elizabeth, <laughs> Elizabeth I, in 1558, became queen. Now, she was the first of the royal family being totally raised as a Protestant. And the Puritans all came back in wanting something to happen that was birthed of God. They wanted to move. Now, the Puritans put together their own Bible, okay? And, and that Bible is called the Geneva Bible, and it was in the year 1560. When Queen Elizabeth I died, her half-brother, King James, there's a lot of them, in 1566 took the throne. And what happened through Elizabeth, the Puritans, the English Puritans, the, the Protestants, had this big movement going, we must separate more from the Roman Catholic Church. We must remember England under Elizabeth was at war with Spain, okay? And uh, we know of all these battles that went on. And because Queen Mary's husband was a prince or king of Spain and all these things happening. So what comes across here was this big move under King uh, James that we have to be separate, we have to come on. But here's the problem. King James didn't like the Puritans, I mean Puritans Bible, the Geneva Bible, because in the footnotes, they stated in the Geneva Bible that the king is subject to God, that no tyrant can rule, they're subject. Well, King James didn't like that. He didn't like the idea that the monarch is called to be in submission to anybody, let alone to the Word of God and some men telling it. So he ordered that the own Bible be written. Now, in England, they call it the authorised. The Americans call it King James. The England never called it King James. The English called it the authorised. But the Americans called it King James. But the fact that he ordered a, new, a Bible be written, they took a lot of it from, from Tyndale and they wrote their own Bible, they had his own 25 scholars doing it. And then he ordered that all of the Geneva Bibles that were around, there would be burnt and destroyed. And in the years, approximately 1604 to 1611, over 21,000 English Puritans, we're not talking about the Dutch 
but English Puritans left and they actually went to Massachusetts, okay? And they set up their home there in the Americas and they did that area there. But what I'm trying to tell you is that when you look at the history of the Bible, you get to see what happens. Now, the great thing about Tyndale's Bible was that it was taken from the original context of the Hebrew and Greek. The King James, even though they used certain parts of Tyndale, it came from the Latin. And that's why we see certain words in the Latin translation, which we confuse. So it's not only the word Lucifer, which in Latin means morning star, it doesn't mean the devil. We also see from John the word mansions, which we think in English means a big house, which it actually means in the Latin from the Greek, the dwelling place or gathering place. It doesn't mean a physical house. So it's not that the King James Bible is leading you astray. I'm not saying that. It's that it's taken a word from Latin rather from the Greek, and our English translation gives us a different picture of what it is. Therefore, there have been and there are these misinterpretations through the years. Do you understand this point? What I wanted to touch on here is another popular one, and it's called the second coming of Jesus. Who's ever held to the area of the second coming of Jesus? Okay. Now, if I asked you this question, and I say, over the course of human history, past, present, and future... How many comings of Jesus are there? Can you put that on the board? Is there A, one? Is there B, two? Is there C, three? Is there D, four? Or is there E, more? Okay. So in your opinion, over the course of human history, past, present, and future, how many comings of Jesus are there? Okay. How many say, and if you could all play along, it would be nice because I know a lot of you could be distracted and I know a lot of you just won't respond. No one's going to take the mickey out of you, okay? And uh, so it's okay. So how many say A, one? Okay. How many say B, two? Okay. How many say C, three? How many say D, four? The correct answer is E. It's E. If you want the notes, they're available anyhow. Denise says, I already knew that. I read the notes. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> now, most people pick B2, like bananas and pajamas too, okay? But they pick two because we have been led to believe or taught that there is the second coming. Now, it doesn't worry me that you hold to that view because my identity is not in my eschatology. My identity is in Jesus Christ. So you can attack my beliefs, you can attack my values, you can attack those areas, you can attack me, it's okay. Uh, I'm over that now. It's, it's whatever. I'm there. But I do believe, and I'm going to use Latin, which is real weird, but sola scriptura, which means scripture only, or scripture alone. Now, throughout my lifetime as a Christian, I was inundated with popular evangelists and Bible teachers and pastors who commonly claim that the Bible speaks extensively about the second coming of Christ. But in actual fact, the Bible contains many, many, many references to many different comings of Jesus, but there's no reference to a single second coming. Now, I am not diminishing detracting or mocking the promise of God. I believe, despite what rumors are, I believe in the ultimate return of Christ. I believe in that. There is a return of Christ. I believe in that wholeheartedly. But I have a problem with thinking that Jesus is off somewhere waiting to come back at some future time and that'll be the second coming. Now, the only scripture that people will try to use in this area, and it's the only one they'll use, is found in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. And it should be on the screen. And Hebrews 9, 28 says this. So also the Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this scripture. This is the only scripture, okay, that people who hold that he only comes twice, hold that this is second coming. Okay? I'd like to read you more of the context of the scripture from verse 24. 
And the author of Hebrews says this from Hebrews 9.24. For the Messiah did not enter a sanctuary made of hands, only a model of the true one, but into heaven itself, so that he, Jesus, might now appear in the presence of God for us. Verse 25. He did not do this to offer himself many times as the high priest enters a sanctuary yearly with the blood of another. Verse 26. Otherwise, he would have had to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. So it says he has appeared one time, okay, at the end of the ages. That means at the end of a period of time. The ages doesn't mean the world, but it means a period of time. So in the Greek, ages doesn't mean world. It means a period of time. Okay? Many times we've translated the word ages, meaning the end of the world. That word ages in Greek means a period of time. Okay? And it says here, for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. So if we're taking Hebrews 9.28, we're saying that's number one. Okay? And just as it's appointed for people to die once and after this judgment, so also the Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. So when I talk to people who hold to a very strong view of premillennialism, they will quote this scripture as referring to a second coming. Okay, But I want to tell you that this scripture here in the second okay, isn't meaning one, two. It's a point form. It goes like this. First, I want to tell you, Jesus came to die for our sins. Secondly, I want to tell you that He is coming again as the final judgment and reward for believers. This is how it's talking. But for some reason, we've taken the mean, first of all, He died for our sins and rose from the grave. That's number one. Number two, He's coming back the second rapture. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So in the Scripture, if you, you can just read it yourself, it's not saying second return, this one. It's saying, number one, Jesus died for our sins. Number two, okay. I can see it's not registering. Let me try something else. Okay. If we limit the comings of Jesus to only two times, then what is the first? His death and resurrection or when he came as a babe in the manger? Would we all believe that he came as a babe in a manger? Can anyone disagree with me there? So that has to mean that was a coming. The Son of God, the Son of God came as a babe in a manger. So if you agree with me that that is a time when Christ came on the earth, and then if you believe he rose again, that then becomes two. Therefore, it would mean his final return is three. Now, if you don't believe that he came to earth as a babe, as being one of them, then you really have a weird doctrine. But it gets worse than that. In Acts 7, 55 to 56, Jesus appears to Stephen. In Acts 9, 1 to 8, Jesus appears to Saul. In Revelation 1, 17, Jesus reveals himself to John. In John 14, 18 to 19, Jesus said, I'll be with you always. In verse 18, He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I'm coming to you, He promised. In verse 19, in a little while, the world will see me no longer, but you will see me because I live, you will live too. That's John 16, verse 16. In John chapter 20, verse 26, it says, after eight days, his disciples were indoors again and Thomas was with them. And even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace to you. Is this a coming? In John 21, 1, it says, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the, to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Remember, they were out fishing again and he made fish in flesh and blood. Is this an appearing of Jesus, a coming? In John 21, 14, it says, now this was the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So if they said in John, this was the third time he appeared after he was raised from the dead, and raised the dead was another one, that's four. And if you count the babe in the manger, that's five. So number two is getting a real problem for us. Now it gets worse because Jesus didn't just happen when he's born in the manger. He was before. In Genesis 17, 1-2, Jesus appears to Abram. 
In Exodus 3, 2 to 15, Jesus appears to Moses at the burning bush. You say, well, that was God. That's Jesus. No, 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 because it was God. No, it's the Bible says that, that, that in Genesis 3, verse 6 with Moses, he identifies himself, I am, which is Elohim, Yahweh. Yeah, yeah, well, I am is God. Well, hang on a minute. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Revelation chapter 22, I think, verse 13. Jesus said, I am. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning. And Jesus identifies himself in Revelation 22, I think, 13. Revelation 1, verse 8, as Elohim. I am. I am. I am the Alpha. So when he speaks to Moses the Bonnie Bush, he says, I am. When he speaks to Abraham, he says, I am. And Daniel 3, 24 to 27, Nebuchadnezzar says, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and the form of the fourth was like the Son of God. <laughs> now I'm beginning to lose count of how many comings there are. If you hold it a view, there's only two. I don't mean to be rude to you, but you've got a real big hole in your doctrine. One Corinthians ten six, Paul says, "Now these things became examples for us, so that we will not desire evil things as they did." That's what Christ is all about: is is understanding the life of it. In verses three to eight of one Corinthians fifteen, it said, "Christ died for our sins according to Scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to Scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. So even Paul is talking about multiple appearances." Verse six, he says, and then Jesus appeared to over 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then he appeared to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one abnormally born, he also appeared to me. Now, Paul here mentions about six or seven appearances or comings. In Acts 1 verse 11. It says, then Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come again and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. Now here's the key word. That word come in Acts 111 in Greek, and I'm not very good at pronouncing Greek unless his name is George, okay, is erkomai, E-R-C-H-O-M-A-I. And that word come in Greek means to come and go. So in the Greek when it says come, it means to come and go. In Matthew 24, four times, we see the word in Greek come, which actually, or coming, which means parousia. And the word parousia in the Greek means presence, arrival, or official visit. But there's nothing in the Bible that says the word just second coming. Now, I'm not saying this to kind of wreck your thinking or to... Some of you already told me I have wrecked your thinking in the last few weeks. But I'm not saying this to wreck your thinking or to make you feel um, upset or anything else. I do believe in the final coming of the Lord. I, I have a problem believing in a, a secret rapture of Matthew 24. I have a problem with that. I won't, I won't lie to you in that area, okay? But that's another day, right? But I do believe in His return. I do believe His coming. Do I believe it could be any time? Yes. Do I believe it'll be tonight? No. But I do believe it could be any time. And I believe that what we have to do is be careful. And this is what I've been trying to say in these three weeks. Be careful of all different trains of thoughts and always bring it back to the Word of God. To the Word of God. And, and you want to know something? And I've been in this place many times. It's okay that perhaps you misunderstood something and you can come back. What's not okay is if you misunderstood something and you know it's not right, but you stubbornly hold to it. That's the problem. There's nothing wrong with saying, whew. I mean, like I said, Hebrews 4.12. I always thought it was cutting asunder of the Spirit, but that's a Greek thought. But it's not meaning that. I don't have a problem standing up here and telling you I had the wrong view in it, but I want you to know from more reading and more research, I understand I was saying it wrong. See, it's not a problem. It's called learning. But what is a problem is like, well, even though it probably should be that way, but because of it, I'm going to hold it anyhow. Well, that's a problem. 
Because we shouldn't feel threatened to have truth brought to us that helps us have a better understanding of God. My desire is to walk in order to bring God glory. And there's been many things biblically where I wonder why people reacted the way they are. Whether it be in Israel, I've seen people, Christians, react in that way. That doesn't bring a testimony to the Jewish people, but confusion as to what they think is happening. But when you bring in, uh, I believe, a truth of these areas, it brings in more understanding to reach out. Uh, I see the same thing in, in end times eschatology and other areas. And, and I have friends. Praise God, I have friends. And uh, I have this sort of thing with certain friends. I, I like to have with certain uh, people outside of our church discussions and uh, uh, we were with John and Val. Pray for Val. She got rushed in the hospital the other day again uh, with um, lung problems. Let's hold her in prayer. But uh, Sandra and I were with John and Val this Friday week back as we do. And uh, they made us this lovely uh, roast dinner. Then, then I think I told you, then I felt bad because you'd only been out of the hospital for three, four hours. You'd been in the hospital. Just came out but still want to sell them. And I love it because uh, I'll sit on the corner of the room separately with John and, and I give him books. And I said, read these books. Tell me what you think. And let's have a, a hearty discussion. Let's discuss things. It's never angry. It's never rise up there. But let's discuss things. So the first thing I did with John was, uh, do you believe in the second coming? He said, yes. I said, do you hold to Hebrews 9.28 as being your theme text? He goes, yes. I said, can we discuss it? He says, he said, yes. The next day, he sent me a text saying, wow, that was a great discussion, Hebrews 9.28. It wasn't a discussion who won, who lost. It was, well, this is what I used to believe. This is what I'm thinking. Tell me what you're saying and let me have a look at the area and let's talk about it because there's no heated moments. There's no threatening to excommunicate. There's no an area, but it's discussion saying, well, what's your thought? Let's deal with it. You know, if we can't come to agreement, move on. But it's the desire to know more of God in depth because it's a journey. See, I'm on a journey. The journey doesn't end to God calls me home. So I'm on this journey that hungers more for God, more of God's things. And I think that's what we all should be doing. I want you blessed. Now we've discussed some um, intriguing subjects the last three sessions we had, including this one. We talked about hell. I know that caused a bit of a stir. We talked about hell, that the word hell is not in the Bible. Hell, a hell, H-E-L, is a German word, which has to do, like what you do for a potato, you place it or you bury it or rest it in the ground. That's what it means. I can understand where the word comes from. But there are four words in the Bible that talks about punishment, but the English word hell is not in it. But we have other words. And when you look at Gehana, which is a literal place till today, and you look at Shaul and you look at Hades and Gehana, and, and, um, the fourth one I forgot for a moment and you look at those areas it helps brings interest the other week we talked about uh, mansions is there a mansion in heaven and we talked about what it means rather than this doctrines that we're somehow all building ourselves our own homes competing whoever's read the latest home and garden magazine to get the best kitchens or butler kitchens or double ovens I don't know what in the area or, or decks or chandeliers and we're all playing concert pianos no, that was, that was entertaining in the 70s and early 80s, but we really made ourselves a bit silly. And some people still hold to that. <laughs> Whatever. But the fact of the matter is, when you read it in the original, you get a better meaning because I don't want to be like the Jehovah's Witnesses and their myth or other groups that have these fantasy uh, stories or the Mormons where they claim that Jesus appeared in America and moved through America after he died and all his areas here which can't be proven historically or archaeologically or anything else. I don't want to be caught where the Bible is challenged by myths. But I want to be able to have healthy discussions to all people and turn them back in. Turn them back in and said, well I'm glad you're interested in the Word of God. May I offer some light on this area? You know what I'm trying to say? It's the truth that releases us into a greater dimension of what He wants. The Bible says you should know the truth, and the truth so what? How many know that God wants to set us free? Can we bow our heads right now? Father, I pray that as we've looked at the Word and even the different translations of the Word, just in part, I pray it doesn't make us be silly or dogmatic or different things, but we realise, Lord, that we're all on a journey. 
And Lord, as Hebrews 4.12 says, that the Word of God just pierces. And it's not meant to say the flesh is evil and all spirit is good, dualism. But rather say the sword pierces our heart in every area. It pierces our heart in the flesh. It pierces our heart in the soul. It pierces our heart in the spirit. What we are striving for, what we are working for, what we're going towards, are we doing it for the significance of His kingdom or are we doing it for our own benefit? You've called me, Lord, not to preach a church, but to preach the kingdom. The kingdom. And I believe the kingdom of God is advancing. Yes, there are those who are opposed to it. Yes, there are those who raise themselves up against it. But the kingdom is advancing. I think of how many babies' lives have been saved just by the stroke of a pen from America. Not getting caught up in the political area, if you like Trump or not, I'm not interested. But just caught up how he said, we're not going to use any government money to support taking a child's life in our own country or overseas. And I think, how many lives may be saved right now? How many babies? Doesn't mean abortion is eradicated in America or other countries. He's just saying there'll be no federal money used. How many lives have been saved? I'm just sitting there contemplating how many lives have been saved. Thinking how close it was to where uh, the previous person who was running against Trump believed in partial birth abortion, yet nobody seemed to be really interested. That she held to a belief that a baby could run their term and have their head come out to shoulders and then kill that baby. And I wondered why nobody, well, there were people, of course, but why there wasn't more noise about that. Well, my hope is not in a president, nor is my hope in a prime minister. But you use them. They can honor you and love you, or they may not honor you and love you, but you can use them. But I know this, Lord, we need a term. We need a reformation in our nation and this world. We need to turn to Jesus. But it's not where we just sit in our bottoms and pray. It's where our life becomes a witness. Friends, when you have to tell someone you're a Christian, that means your witness is not as good as it could be. Because our life should declare that we're Christian. And then they ask us what's different, and we tell them the name of Jesus. It's like Luke, who this morning came to know the Lord. He's been coming to church now for close to a year. But today, he said, today is the day that I need to know Jesus. And you know what did it? It was the love of this fellowship, the love of brothers and sisters, the love of the people who said, we love you unconditionally. We will not judge you, condemn you. He brought in his child. He had his child dedicated. He's asked me to do the wedding this year uh, for him and his, his fiance, who is a Christian. And today he made a decision to follow Jesus. Now I rejoice on that because it wasn't a mere decision. It's a well thought out conversion that has taken 12 months roughly to say, I have now decided to follow Jesus. Weigh up the cost to follow him. Don't make it a mere little thing like the color of a shirt you wear, but make it something you weigh up and commit.